absolutely delighted to see, see so many of you. Again, I was just here about an hour ago. <laughs> I'm going to try a little different seat this time. I was told not to touch any of these. These are absolutely beautifully cued in for this next a musical presentation you're going to have. Uh, part two. This is where the rubber hits the road. How do you make yourself a heart attack proof? And the, what you're seeing on the scene today on the screen is Bill Sheldon. Now, Bill Sheldon, uh, in 1984, 85, was the chairman of the Cleveland Clinic Department of Cardiology. And I was uh, really going to be forever indebted to Bill because of, uh, he allowed me to appear before his department to make a suggestion for whole food plant-based nutrition. Now, what in the world was I doing as a general surgeon? Who ever heard of a general surgeon getting interested in nutrition? This was halfway through my career, and what prompted me to do this was the fact that I had become increasingly disillusioned with my duties as chairman of the... <laughs> this guy will never let me down. <laughs> uh, chairman of the Breast Cancer Task Force. And for no matter how many women I was doing breast cancer surgery, I was doing absolutely nothing for the next unsuspecting victim. And that really uh, prompted me to do a bit of global research. And it was quite impressive to see that breast cancer rates in Kenya, for example, were something like 30 and 40 times less frequent than in the United States. And even in uh, rural uh, Japan, in the 1950s, breast cancer was very infrequently identified. And yet, as soon as the Japanese women began to migrate to the United States, but the second and third ge uh, generation still pure Japanese American. They now began to experience the same rate of breast cancer as their Caucasian counterpart. Even more powerful, perhaps, was cancer of the prostate. In the entire nation of Japan, in 1958, how many autopsy proven deaths were there in the entire nation of Japan from prostate cancer? 18. 18, the most mind-boggling public health figure I've ever heard. By 1978, 20 years later, they were up to 137, but still pales in comparison to the 28,000 who will die of prostate cancer this year in this country. So somewhere along that journey, began apparent to me that there would be more bang more bang for the buck if we looked at cardiovascular disease. Because of, along this journey, it was apparent there were multiple cultures where cardiovascular disease was virtually non-existent. And it just seemed to me that if we could get people to eat in a way that they could eliminate the leading killer of women and men in Western civilization, cardiovascular disease, that at the same time, they would have an optimal opportunity to diminish the likelihood of having the common Western cancers of breast, prostate, colon, and perhaps pancreatic. So this is Bill Sheldon, and I went to, to Bill. But first, I had to uh, decide to do this myself. I was a cholesterol holic. I grew up on an Aberdeen Angus beef farm and a dairy farm in upstate New York. And it was very difficult to accept the idea that I would no longer eat those, uh, <laughs> those wonderful uh, cholesterol foods that I enjoyed. And I knew, though, that I was going to do this. And Dr. Prochaska from Rhode Island has done a wonderful study with smokers uh, showing how people make a lifestyle change. You go through these different categories of pre-contemplation, contemplation, action, and maintenance. Now, I was over here somewhere between, let's say, contemplation and action. And I can still remember uh, when it happened. Uh, Anne and I were at a surgical conference in New Haven, Connecticut. And at that surgical conference, the papers were really very boring. Uh, the weather was rainy and rotten. 
but they always had a banquet after these conferences. And at the banquet, the waitress put in front of me a roast beef plate. It was so covered with roast beef, it was draped over the side. I took a look at it, and I just began shaking my head, and Ann looked at me and said, what? Are you gonna eat your roast beef? I said, no, no. She said, well, then I'll have it. <laughs> meeting in New Haven. And his sister came down with breast cancer. And that's when she looked at me and said, I will you. That was April of 1984, and that was my last bit of any kind of red meat. Uh, <clears throat> so after I had done this, and we had done it ourselves for close to a year, I went to Bill Sheldon and asked if I could perhaps speak to his department of cardiology to get about 24 patients who was, was, had significant cardiovascular disease and so obviously if I couldn't get them to, to eat that paste. And that was kind of the, the, uh, the background of how this started. Now it's a small study and it was my first of the two of these. It was a small study because I was still actively involved as a surgeon and uh, the, uh, that my time was so limited, I thought this was a trouble the group that I could handle. Now, I've given you already the background yesterday or Monday on this, and the whole idea was to see if we couldn't like, try to get uh, patients to keep their cholesterol close to 150 and their LDL at 80. And these are the foods that I wanted them to absolutely eliminate. This, these are the foods that every time they pass your lips, you injure the endothelial cell. Let's just have a little review because of what was on, on Monday. Remember this. All experts would agree that where this disease has its inception, its onset, its beginning, is when we progressively injure the life jacket and the guardian of our blood vessels, which happens to be the inner delicate innermost lining, the endothelium. And what makes the endothelial cells so magical is the gas nitric oxide that it produces that protects us from ever developing blockages and plaques. So literally, everybody on the planet who has cardiovascular disease, whether it's Chicago, New York, London, Berlin, or <laughs> Miami, if you have cardiovascular disease, it's because by now you have so trashed your endothelial cells, you've turned them into a train wreck, you don't have enough nitric oxide to protect you. So, let's eliminate the foods that injure endothelium, and they are any drop of oil. Olive oil, corn oil, soybean oil, safflower oil, sunflower oil, coconut oil, palm oil, oil in a cracker, oil in a piece of bread, oil in a salad dressing. Oil injures endothelial cells as does anything with a mother or a face. Meat, fish, chicken, fowl, turkey, eggs, and anything that is dairy. Milk, cream, butter, cheese, ice cream, and yogurt, and sugary drinks. Diet colas, Pepsi, Coke, and sugary foods. Cakes, pies, cookies, stevia, agave, excesses of maple syrup, molasses, and honey. I don't like them. As you heard from the panel, I don't like coffee with caffeine. Coffee with caffeine can cause endothelial dysfunction. Decaf, okay. Tea with caffeine, okay. All right. So, what are you going to eat? <laughs> what are you going to eat? Uh, we'll get to that in a minute. <laughs> this is the work of Stanley Hayes in the clinic. And I want you to pay close attention to this because this is going to be your argument when we get into somebody who's ketogenic or paleo or Atkins, and that is that you <laughs> But Stan Mason said, as you see listed up here, these are the animal foods. Milk, dairy, seafood, red meat. And when an omnivore consumes these foods which contain the molecules of lecithin and Carnitine. They, they, the omnivore, has in their microbiome, in their gut, 
bacteria, which when they metabolize the carnitine and the lecithin, you get TMA, which is rapidly oxidized in your liver to trimethylamine oxide. And trimethylamine oxide injures your blood vessels. Here's you have to be the schematic, and you can see lecithin and carnitine, gut bacteria, TMAO, vascular disease. But what he also discovered that is he took he took patients, patients who were totally plant-based, totally plant-based, fed them a lamb chop, measured their blood for TMA. Wasn't there. What? However, however, if if you continue to eat that lamb chop four or five days, now then you begin to cultivate bacteria in your own microbiome that can create that same kind of, of mischief. Well, now red meat, I throw that in there only because I don't want to forget that it was in October of 2015 that at the World Health Organization, just imagine, the World Health Organization representatives from every country came to an agreement that red meat now should have the same category of concern for carcinogenicity as smoking cigarettes. And Harvard, uh, the Harvard study of health professionals carried it a step further that the risk of dying was up 12% with daily red meat and 20% with hot dogs and, and bacon. Now just for those of you who got a little nervous when I said no oil, here it is for you. This is one of several peer-reviewed scientific studies that says the following. Olive, soybean, and palm oil intake have a similar acute detrimental effect over the endothelial function in healthy young subjects. That's so often, that is so often the part that I find in patients with heart disease that doesn't work. Patients can be wonderfully plant-based, but they somehow feel that we don't have it right about oil. And they can't understand why their disease is progressive. Gotta stop the oil. I just wrote a scientific paper. It's entitled is oil healthy question mark. And then I discuss multiple animal studies, multiple human studies, clearly indicating how oil can harm you. Okay, now, I don't want to spend too much time on this, but these are some slides I borrowed from my good friend Jeff Tobik, and it's what Colin was talking about during the uh, during the panel discussion, this is, he wants us to have, ideally, uh, a relationship between omega-3 fats and omega-6 that are something like one to one or three to one. In other words, not too much omega-6. It is so easy to get too much omega-6 fat, fats. In America, it's something like 17 to one or even 30 to one. However, <laughs> How are you going to, let, well, let's go through and look at this, see how, how, that, how problematic that can be. Here in the orange is the level of omega-6, white is omega-3. So olive, 11 to 1, canola, 2 to 1, peanut, 6 to 1, flaxseed. Now, I don't want you to have flaxseed oil, but we do encourage patients to have flaxseed meal, a tablespoon or two on their cereal. Sunflower, 15, omega-6 to 1, omega-3. Corn oil, 79 to 1, soy, 7 to 1. Now, here we look again at the nuts and seeds. Um, English walnut, 4 to 1. Black walnuts and avocado, 16 to 1. Pecans, 20 to 1, 37 to 1. Pistachios, filberts, 88 to 1. And here we are, saturated fat. Black walnuts, 5%. Almonds and flax, 6%. Sunflower and flubber, 7%. English walnuts and pecans, 8%, 9%. Pistachio, cashew, 13%, pumpkin, 14 
Cabo 15 as our macadamia, and Brazil 21. So here's what you're going to eat. You're going to eat all those marvelous whole grains for your cereal, bread, pasta, noodles, 101 different types of legumes, lentils, and beans, all these marvelous red, yellow, and green leafy vegetables, and some fruit. Now, I want to share with you something that we, is not, is not in my book, but it's something that we've started in the last seven years. And that is, I asked the patient with coronary artery disease to just imagine shrinking their head to a size that could crawl into your coronary artery with a plaque, and they could look at the plaque and see that it was an absolute cauldron of oxidative inflammation. So we need antioxidants. But no, do not go down to the health food store and buy a jug of pills that says antioxidant, because it doesn't work, and it's going to be harmful. I need you to get your antioxidants from food. Fair enough. What food? Food that is high in what we call ORAC value. O-R-A-C, oxygen radical absorptive capacity. So if you're having raspberries, blueberries, strawberries, and blackberries on your morning oat cereal, terrific. However, ooh. <laughs> However, nothing can trump the antioxidant value of green leafy vegetables. So I need you to chew, to chew a green leafy vegetable six times a day. Six times a day roughly the size of your fist after it has first been boiled in water, five and a half to six minutes, so it's nice and tender. And then you must anoint it with several drops of a delightful balsamic vinegar. Why? Because the acetic acid in the vinegar has been shown to restore the nitric oxide synthase enzyme contained within the endothelial cell that is responsible for making nitric oxide. So you're going to chew this alongside your breakfast cereal, again as a mid-morning snack, again with your lunch and sandwich, that's three, mid-afternoon, four, dinner time, five, and of course I adore it when you have that evening snack of kale. <laughs> What are you doing? All day long you are basking, you are bathing that horrible oxidative cauldron of inflammation with nature's most powerful antioxidant. Now, there are other ways that chewing these greens is going to help. You recall on Monday when we talked about the endothelial progenitor cells, which arise from our bone marrow to replace our senescent, injured, worn out endothelial cells. Okay. Chewing green leafy vegetables enhances the, the power of your bone marrow to make endothelial progenitor cells, which makes them rise. The third thing that eating the greens does is that when, <clears throat> when you are chewing this green, you are chewing a nitrate. As you chew this nitrate in your mouth, it is going to mix with the facultative anaerobic bacteria that reside in the grips and grooves of your tongue. Those facultative anaerobic bacteria are going to reduce the nitrate that you are chewing in your mouth to a nitrite. When you swallow the nitrite, it will be further reduced by your gastric acid in your stomach to more nitric oxide, which can now enter your nitric oxide pool. Pretty exciting stuff. Now you're probably asking, what are the green leafy vegetables that Dr. Russell's been talking about? Some of you have heard me say this before, what they are. Bok choy, Swiss chard, kale, collards, collard greens, beet greens, mustard greens, turnip greens, snapping cabbage, Brussels sprouts, rocket, cauliflower, cilantro, parsley, spinach, and arugula, and asparagus, and the top five are 
kale, Swiss chard, spinach, arugula, and bee greens. And look what it does for your memory. <laughs> Get alarmed 
are the date up there. The date is not how long it took for the reversal to take place. The date is how long it took me to raise the money for this, because I had no money for this study. What you're looking at here, which is the smallest improvement that the naked eye can see, is a 10% improvement in a 67-year-old retired pediatrician. And you're looking at the left anterior descending coronary artery. And this was described from here to the right over here as a 10% improvement. It's a little easier to see in this 58-year-old factory worker where you're looking at the circumflex artery that goes to the back of the heart. This was described as a 20% improvement from here to here. And now you're looking at the right coronary artery in a 54-year-old security guard. And this was described as a 30% improvement from here to here. This is Joe Crow. Joe Crow appears in the first chapter of my book. And Joe replaced me as chairman of the Breast Cancer Task Force. And Joe, in 1996, at age 44, began getting chest pain, chest pain. Cholesterol was 156, no family history. He was not hypertensive, he was not diabetic, he was not a smoker, he regularly exercised. In October, into October of 96, cardiology worked him up and could find absolutely nothing in October of 1996. One month later, in November, he was uh, finished his surgical schedule and sat down to write post-operative orders. While I was doing that, suddenly the elephant was sitting on his chest, severe pain in his left jaw, shoulder, and arm. He was whipped down to the cath lab because he was having he was having a heart attack. They start the catheterization, cardiac arrest, resuscitate, finish the catheterization with one more cardiac arrest. Then he stabilized and sent up to the floors, and three days later he was eligible to be discharged. But he was very depressed because at the time of his angiogram, what they found was that the entire lower one-third of his left anterior descending, the widowmaker, was now all moth-eaten and diseased over too long a second to just pound in stent after stent after stent. And it was too far down the artery for a bypass. So he was very depressed. So Ann and I had Joe and his wife out for dinner two weeks after his heart attack. Joe, come on. You've been eating this horrible Western diet. You've got the typical Western disease. Why don't you think about going plant-based? We've got 10 years of data. Okay, yes. I'll give it a shot. I'm not taking any of those statin drugs. I don't trust them. I had too many side effects. But uh, they couldn't offer me anything else, so I'll give it a try. Joe Crow became the absolute personification of commitment to whole food, plant-based nutrition. And over the next two and a half years, 30 months, his total cholesterol plummeted. His LDL went from 98 to 38. And then he had another, another engine. And our doors in the surgical office area are three doors apart. So at noon time, on the day that I knew that he had had earlier his follow-up angiogram, I walked over to his office and opened the door, and there he was, <coughs> sitting behind his desk. <coughs> Joe, I understand you had the old follow-up angiogram earlier this morning. Mind sharing with me? How'd it go? Got up from his desk, walked around, put his arms around me, had a couple of these, said, uh, I think we may be doing okay. 
I said, well, that's good. Have there been any chance that I could see? <laughs> the, uh, the answer, Graham, and he said, yeah. So, <laughs> this was kind of exciting, but let's be honest about it. Uh, this isn't going to happen to everybody. In the, in the one-third of patients who perhaps have a plaque which is soft, new, early, made up of fat, cholesterol, and inflammation, the likelihood of getting this kind of regression is very powerful, especially with somebody who's as adherent as Joe was. What's that? Ignore it? It's hard to ignore it. <laughs> Are they announcing lunch? Uh, okay. Uh, ignore it. So, uh, Joe uh, <clears throat> had a remarkable success, but now if the plaque has been in the artery for, de for decades, it's an old plaque and it is made up of fibrosis and scar and calcification, it may not regress. But it is going to be my job today, before we leave this auditorium this morning, or early afternoon, I've got to show you how even those patients who cannot regress their blockage, how even they can get back to full activity of daily living without restriction. All right. Now, what happened to, the, uh, to these patients? I remember. Well, I knew within the first two or three months that there were these six guys, nice guys. They just didn't get it. And I had no money for the study. So I, with their blessing, I released them back full time to their expert cardiologist. They became my sort of quasi control group, if you will. And what we found after 12 years, those six patients back with their expert cardiologist, two died and the other four had to have another bypass operation. Now what about the 18 who stayed with us? That was kind of interesting. We wanted to know, in the eight years prior to coming into our study, how many cardiac events of worsening disease that they had while they were in the hands of expert cardiologists, they had these uh, 49 events of worsening disease that you see categorized up here, however, in the next 12 years, 17 of those 18 had no further events on our program. At six years, yes, we did have one little sheep who wandered from the flock. Got into the lamb chops, the french fries, the glazed donuts, more chest pain, another bypass, but now he's back with the flock and proves the point that I'm sharing with you today. Now, why worldwide, there have been other studies that have been done on nutrition with heart disease, but none of them, I'm sure, none of them, none of them are as mean as I am. Here's the 31,000 participants, five different types of health program divided in degrees of uh, excellence. When they compared the best to the worst, there was a 35% less than likelihood of death in the better group, 43% less infarction, 19% less likelihood of stroke. Here's another one from the UK, 44,000 participants, 15,000 of whom were vegetarians, that is they didn't have meat or fish, and they found that the vegetarians had an experience of decreased BMI, a decreased blood pressure, a decreased cholesterol, and a less than likelihood of developing heart disease of 32%. Now, <clears throat> although I was very excited about our small study, that we had the ability to reverse heart disease, uh, the rest of the world wasn't quite, <laughs> quite, quite excited. And we took quite a hit, you know, the study was too small, and how do you know that without extreme diet that you're ever gonna 
uh, achieve that again in a larger group. And so uh, we did. And this was a study following patients close to four years. Of 198 patients, we had 200, two were lost to follow up. And of those 198, there were uh, 177, or 89.3 percent, who were compliant. Now that's close to 90 percent. And most of the physicians who criticize our study will say that, well, they're not able to uh, get a patient to transition to whole food plant-based nutrition. And it's really not that the, the method is wrong, it's how the method is articulated. And with all due respect to my cardiovascular colleagues and those who criticize the saying that they can't get their patients to do this, you're never going to make that kind of behavior change if you see a patient for 10 to 15 minutes in the office. That just isn't going to happen, especially if you see them without their significant other or their, or their spouse. So what we did was uh, a little bit, what we presently do uh, is that once a month, I conduct an intensive uh, counseling seminar for patients with cardiovascular disease. And during this counseling, they're going to learn all about how they have created their disease and precisely how we are going to empower them as the locus of control to halt and reverse their disease. And boy, do they ever get a mouthful about the endothelial cell and nitric oxide. That is so absolutely critical because uh, what you are doing is you're taking the mystery out of the science. Uh, you're putting science in a vocabulary that they can get their arms around. And if they really get it understood, they kind of rejoice for the fact that now they understood that it wasn't because of their genes, it wasn't because of their stress, it was because of all that horrible Western diet that they've been eating. And so that was pretty much uh, uh, the story. <laughs> Uh, this is a group, and the, uh, I think you've got to play some games with patients a little bit because uh, if I'm in the room with it, these patients after they've had an hour of the endothelial cell and the nitric oxide, <clears throat> I will look them in the eye and I'll say, now we've got a few hours to go, but is there anybody here who just doesn't understand about nitric oxide and the endothelial cell? And is there anybody who dares look me in the eye and say that when you leave here, you can't wait to destroy more endothelial cells? <laughs> and then, of course, I went to on Monday the whole kind of the fun charade you have when you get asked to somebody's house or when you go to a restaurant. Remember, there are four, four reasons to go to a restaurant. One is you don't have to do the cooking. Two is you don't have to do the dishes. Three is the ambiance. And four is the companionship. You never go to a restaurant to destroy endothelial cells. And you do that by telling them you're a dog who's deathly allergic to a single drop of any oil, nothing with animal protein, no dairy, no sugar, and the, uh, the waiter or the waiters can't find it in the menu, then you ask for the chef, the chef comes out and he'll find you something in 23 minutes, back comes beans and rice or a potato with vegetables, baked potato with vegetables, it's doable, but uh, don't go out to eat to ever destroy endothelial cells. That's the life check. Okay. Now, how do we do with that group? Well, uh, one patient, when he was in China, ate off the economy and misbehaved, had a small stroke uh, of those who were adherent. Those who were not adherent, 62% uh, in that four year period had a further progression of disease. So I did a kind of a interesting thing. I wanted to compare our results with those that are in some of the better known cardiovascular health studies that are out there. Here on this ordinate, you see major cardiovascular, major cardiac event, heart attack, stroke, and death. So let's go over here. On the far right, this is the Lyon Diet Heart Study, a famous Mediterranean study. And what do you see? 25% heart attack, stroke, and death in four years. Natural history of coronary disease out of Columbia University in New York City, 20% heart attack, stroke, and death. And Bill Bolton's garage study, 
19% heart attack, stroke, and death. Here we are, six tenths of a percent. What's going on here? Why is there this difference? Because we are treating the causation of the illness, the causation of the disease. Ever since the days of Hippocrates, there's been a basic covenant of trust between the caregiver and the patient that whenever possible, the caregiver will share with the patient what is the causation of the illness. And today in cardiovascular medicine, that's not being done. However, I'm proud to say that four years ago, uh, along with Robert Osfeld, along with Monica Agarwal, Dean Ornish, and Neil Barnard, and a host of other uh, wonderful physicians, we were asked to become a member of the American, Cardio Cardi American College of Cardiology because we were asked to join their nutrition committee. And the idea is to try to educate cardiologists about uh, the causation of the illness that they have been designated to treat. Because in none of their medical school training, in none of their postgraduate training, do they ever receive sufficient information about nutrition. Hopefully that's, that's changing. Now, also in July of 2014, this is a, another small study. What was I doing? Writing up three patients. Well, these three patients to me to perfectly personify the absolute uh, challenge uh, that standard cardiovascular medicine is facing. Now, the first of these three patients I have yet to meet, he is from Newfoundland, Canada. And when he was age 44, he had a complete blockage of his right carotid, carotid artery to his brain and a small stroke. He got over that well, but he was having at the same time miserable chest pain and angina. And so he saw a wonderful cardiovascular surgeon in Toronto who, despite the fact that he had already now occluded one artery to his brain, was willing to operate on him, and he got a wonderful result. Now he was 69 years of age, and he was in deep trouble again. He was diabetic, he was 40 pounds overweight, he had erectile dysfunction, and he had this severe angina. And his one remaining carotid artery was now 90% blocked. Of all things to have happened at this moment, his daughter, 37 years of age, had a heart attack. And during her convalescence, she found a book. <laughs> <laughs> Prevent and reverse heart disease. And she said to her father, Pop, we got to do this together. A year later, I got a letter, my first correspondence with Bob Mercer. Dear Dr. Esselstyn, I wanted to thank you. I've lost 40 pounds. All of my angina has disappeared. My erectile dysfunction has disappeared. My diabetes has disappeared. And my one remaining carotid artery, which was 90% blocked, is now 67% blocked. Pretty fun stuff. Now, there is Bob Marston. Uh, the next is Art Soteros. And Art, at age 32, became diabetic. He was overweight. At age 42, he came to the Cleveland Clinic for his chest pain and angina. And he had the first of 14 stents. Then he was told, you got this aggressive type of disease. The stents aren't cutting it. You're going to have to have a bypass. So we had the bypass. And that was good for 15 months. Now he was back in the soup again. And so they just said, you're going to have to deal with drugs to try to make this happen. Found out about our program, came, within four months, he had lost 40 pounds. But his diabetes had disappeared. All of his angina had disappeared. And here's a picture of our Zotero's before and after. And then the next one we have was uh, uh, Jim McNamara. Jim McNamara, at age 55, had a small stroke. They operated on his artery, but it wasn't successful, and the artery completely closed. So they said, that's OK. You've got the one on the left. <laughs> and then he began to get progressively this provocation, pain in his calf muscle. 
and shorter and shorter distances when he would walk, this burning pain in his calf muscle from the lack of blood supply. And then um, he noticed that when he tried to put his foot up in bed after a half hour or so in bed, his foot began to burn and was numb and just driving crazy. And somehow his wife found out about our program and he became totally committed. He lost 35 pounds, and within three months, uh, all of his leg pain had disappeared. And now he was able, six months after he started our program, he was at the left before, and on the right, he was now dancing with his daughter after her wedding. And both of these men have been regularly appearing at our, cardiovascular, our monthly cardiovascular conference to share their story with those who are in, in attendance who can then say to themselves, listen, if he or she can do this, I can do this. Now, so, with this nutritional approach, there is no morbidity with this, or excuse me, there's no mortality with the diet, there's no morbidity from the diet, and there's really, when you think about it, no added expense, the benefit of who is the time, and patients are empowered by the knowledge that they are in control, because think of it, Somebody who's had a heart attack is walking around with the sword of Damocles hanging over their head wondering, when do I get my next heart attack? Nonsense. You never have to have another heart attack. You can eat in the way that you make yourself heart attack proof. Now, I'm not sure that, that, uh, <laughs> that every physician is cut out for this. Matter of fact, I know they're not. For instance, we have physicians who never like to talk to patients. They go, they go into pathology. They are marvelous. They do an incredibly wonderful job for us, looking under these glass microscopic slides, giving us a diagnosis. They are superb and important, as are radiologists who work in the basement, flipping up these films, reading their films. They don't have to talk to patients very often. Nor do the anesthesiologists. The anesthesiologists will talk to their patients briefly. You're going to get sleepy. <laughs> but there will be patients who absolutely thrive on wanting to, to share this message. And every physician should know of the, of the power of plant-based nutrition and the willingness to share those patients with physicians who have the time and the willingness to instruct them in this approach. And the reason that I guess I feel, one of the reasons I feel so animated, uh, even 19 years after retiring from surgery, about the field of medicine is that there's so many of these diseases that we uh, have that are both due to inflammation that whole food plant-based nutrition can take care of. And it's, uh, it's almost as if for medicine, the heavens have opened up and said, listen, try this. No expense, no side effects, it works. Whole food plant-based nutrition annihilates 85% of illness. All right, now somebody will say, well, how are you gonna get it done in the country? Well, here is Finland. What you're looking at here is Karelia. In 1972, Karelia was the heart attack capital of the world. All these retur returning young veterans from World War II, lumberjacks, smoking cigarettes, eating lots and lots of meat, lots and lots of dairy, clotted cream. Clotted cream was the, was the fad. A young physician uh, from Helsinki, uh, Pekka Pusta, went to Karelia and talked with all the local authorities, argued with the dairy industry, got the people to try to stop, stop, stop smoking. Look what happened in Korea as a result of that effort. Over the next 30 years, they decreased their heart attacks by 85%. The rest of Finland caught on a little bit later, and over the same time period, they stopped by 80%. But the one that I also am fascinated by, what do you suppose happened to the cancer rate in Korea during that time? <laughs> it was decreased by 67%. Pretty exciting stuff. Now look, what is the good of having a great heart if 
your brain isn't there. Now we know from the studies of Megan Leary and her team from the West Coast, who in 2001, at the stroke meetings in Miami, they reported their observation looking at 5,500 MRIs of the brains of Americans. And at age 50, they begin to see these tiny little white spots. What are these tiny little white spots? They are little strokes. But you know, age 50, big brain, tiny stroke, not a problem. However, now, before you can blink your own eyes, you're 65. You have had 15 more years of the good old American diet. And more often than before, you find yourself saying, sweetheart, we're going to leave the car keys. Ah, oh, you get through that. <coughs> now, <laughs> you blink your eye. You're 75. You look at her and you say, sweetheart, where did I leave the car? <laughs> You get through that. You're 85. You look at her and you say, are you my sweetheart? <laughs> I can't remove that. I can't, ask, I can't reverse that. You don't suddenly wake up on your 85th birthday with dementia. You work hard in all those preceding decades to lay the, lay the foundation for dementia. All right? Doesn't, doesn't have to happen, I think. There's a wonderful book by Dean uh, and Aisha Shirza uh, about how to stop dementia and the food. It really comes down to eating plant-based, but adding to it, getting adequate, adequate sleep, adequate exercise, especially leg exercise, yeah, and socialization. Those are, those are absolute. And be sure you don't have sleep apnea. Sleep apnea is an absolute killer for your brain health. Sleep apnea. Okay. Now here's a normal MRI. But over here, you can see that this next one, I counted 90 of those strokes. Can you imagine how a message is going to go through all that scar tissue? Now this, this is the work of Pierre Aramenko. Here you see a heart, and here's the aorta, the large vessel that leads off the left ventricle. And you can see the artist tried to draw here that you do have coronary artery disease that can arise in your ascending or aorta as well. And what Pierre Aramenko did was, he did transesophageal echocardiography because the esophagus has such anatomical proximity to the ascending aorta. He was able to divide these Frenchmen into three groups, those that had one millimeter of atherosclerotic debris growing on the inside of the aorta, one to 3.9 millimeters of debris, and over 3.9 millimeters of debris. Then he followed them for three years. Guess what? Which group had the greatest rate of stroke? Right, the group that had over 3.9 millimeters of debris. And when you see this in spades, is when the surgeon is doing a bypass operation, he has to take a Satinsky plant and pinch up a little cuff of this aorta to sew in the bypass. Now, if the time that he is clapping up here, monitoring the middle cerebral with an ultrasound will be the nurse. And when he says clamping up here, she will hear whoosh. And if it's four bypasses, it's whoosh. Now, sadly, if the patient should die, and come to autopsy, as did with Dr. Guy McCann in Johns Hopkins, what do you see in the brain? You see, whoosh, and it could probably what it explains why approximately 50% of persons who have a bypass will permanently lose beyond five years, 22% of their cognition. Often this is not talked about. Now here what you see, the brain is all the way out to the skull. That's good. Here, the brain, what is this? This is brain atrophy. You don't want cerebral atrophy. How do you protect from getting cerebral atrophy? 
your exercise. What grows when you exercise? What grows is your memory, the hippocampus, and your executive thinking, your frontal lobe. So, if you're going to walk four or five, six times a week, roughly fast enough almost to break a sweat, or you can bike, or you can run. And here, uh, what you see is, on the left, a pulse line. This is a patient who was coming to my office and in crossing the Skyway had to stop five times because of pain in his calf muscle because he had a partial block artery in his thigh. But I was so focused on his heart, I forgot all about his leg. Until 11 months into the study, he said, Dr. Esselstyn, do you recall when I first started your program, I had to stop five times crossing the Skyway to your office. This last month, they got to be four times. Then it was three. Two, one, he said, I don't stop, the pain is gone. Okay, Don, back you go to the vascular lab. And now, it was double. It was absolutely double. We suddenly now had absolutely rock solid scientific proof, irrefutable, that food and food alone could absolutely arrest and reverse cardiovascular disease. And you're probably saying, well, now wait a minute. What about the stratin drugs? Well, I'm going to say, now wait a minute. This is 1986. We didn't have any statin drug at that time. Pretty exciting. So that for the many, many, many people that can't take the statin drug because of serious side effects, they should not feel in any way precluded from enjoying these similar benefits. Now, this has to be a high school, a retired high school chemistry teacher, and in his retirement, he and his wife, they love entering square dance contests, but it was during a fast square dance that he got trouble bilateral with this calf pain because of a partially blocked artery that you can see that these vascular surgeons whom he consulted with got, and what they found was all this blockage that you can see, however, he just didn't like that idea of the big operation, and he consulted with us and said, Dr. Esselstyn, if I choose your method, how long will it take me to get rid of this calf pain? And so I looked at him with great wisdom in my face. <laughs> and I said, probably about 10 or 11 months. Three months later, I got a phone call. Dr. Esselstyn, you do not speak the truth. The pain is gone. Okay. Now, while all of you are from this boat right now, when you get landed, you're going to scatter to different parts of the planet, I guess, and the United States. And I don't know a lot what it's like in your hometown, but in Cleveland, Ohio, if you are watching a mystery or you're watching a sporting event, just before the advertisement comes on, you will hear the mellifluous tones of the advertiser, the man say, when the moment is right, will you be ready? <laughs> now we all know that the penile artery is really quite tiny compared to the coronary artery and not infrequently before somebody comes down with heart disease, they'll find they may not any longer be able to raise the flag. However, all is not lost, not infrequently, 10 or 11 months after I've consulted somebody, I'll get a phone call, Dr. Esselstyn, yeah, this is Mr. So-and-so, sure enough. Yeah, I really thought I ought to give you a call because recently something has come up. <laughs> And I don't, I don't know if I owe you another check. <laughs> now, here is what I promised before we wrap it up. That how can you reverse cardiovascular disease? Uh, when the plaque is made up of scar and fibrosis and calcification, and it's not going to go away. Now, what you're looking at here in a uh, 58-year-old school bus driver from Youngstown, Ohio. Cholesterol is 261 at the time that he has his PET scan. And this PET rubidium dihuramol scan 
If it's orange or yellow, that's good. Good blood supply. But if it's green, this is bad. It's poor blood supply. So at this time, we counseled him. And 10 days later, his cholesterol was 126. Six weeks later, it's all back. What's going on here? This happens to be now a 60-year-old stockbroker from downtown Cleveland, 248 cholesterol. Here is his baseline. It's orange or yellow, but not here. Here it is green, ischemic, this is poor blood supply, okay? We counsel him and 10 days later, cholesterol 137. Three weeks later, we repeated it. It's, it's all bad. What's going on here? We didn't get any. We didn't wash out any plaque in three weeks. What could be possibly happening here? So, this is the heart without any muscle. It is all blood vessels. And what you see here are all these, this is the, these are the major epicardial coronary arteries, the anterior descending, the right coronary artery, and the, and the circumflex. When they are riding on the surface of the heart, they are readily accessible to the surgeon for bypasses and for stent, things like stents. Where do they all go? They all deliver a blood supply to the heart muscle. That's the important thing. That's where the oxygen and nutrients have to go. So four years ago, I called <coughs> Rodriguez, uh, Cleveland Clinic, cardiovascular pathologist, who dissects over 200 hearts a year from the deceased. And I said, Rod, how often do you ever see good old-fashioned garden variety coronary artery disease in the heart vessels once it is dived into the muscle. Never. Well, once in a very, very big while with a severe diabetic. Otherwise, never. Now I have the answer. When we see these patients initially, these thousands and thousands and thousands of interconnected muscular arteries are all diseased, not with cardiovascular disease as we understand it with blockages, but they are all pinched. They are vasoconstricted. Why? Because when we see these patients initially, their endothelial system is so beaten down. Not only are they barely making any nitric oxide, which dilates the vessel, but now your endothelial cells have become your enemy. They are now making two molecules, endothelin and thromboxane, which are vasoconstrictive. What does that mean? That means this entire cascade of intramuscular arteries, microvascular disease, are all pinched, vasoconstricted. And it is so exciting and so dramatic when you have a patient with this type of angina and they just get it right. Often within four to six or seven days, there is marked relief of their angina. Why? Because suddenly, the endothelial cell is no longer being hammered down and injured, and it stops making these vasoconstrictors, thromboxane and endothelin, and starts once again making nitric oxide, the great vessel dilator. So this entire enormous, cascade of vessels opens up, which allows these patients to get back to full activity with daily living without uh, restriction. Now, this is the goal, then. We start out here, we want to thicken the cap over the plaque, that happens, and now you've made yourself heart attack proof, or you go all the way, as Dr. Crow did, with a, with a plaque that happens to be new, mostly made of inflammation and can decrease and shrink. This is the work of uh, Newman and Harris. It's a 400 meter walk study. What it consisted of, it took patients, all of them over 70, 
You walk up 20 meters, come back 20 meters, that's 40, 10 times. They timed it. After six years, they then followed them up, comparing the fastest to the slowest. And the fastest to the slowest, the slowest had the greatest increase of new partial disability. The slowest had the greatest increase of total, uh, total disability. And the slowest had the greatest amount of mortality. What's going on? Remember, we talked about how those little strokes occur. When those strokes occur across the top of your brain, all of us have a motor, motor strip across the top of the brain. And when you interfere with and injure that motor strip, then you no longer are moving your muscles with alacrity and dispatch. And just as your muscles are shrinking, withering and atrophying, so is your brain withering, shrinking, and atrophying. I borrowed this from Dave Schumann, an endocrinologist, that diabetes got this man to go plant-based Literally, within days, he starts to get to a much more normal level, and he said, I've got to get you a new slide because this man no longer has diabetes. Here's another. A woman thriving on dairy and, a dairy and meat. The uh, urinary calcium should be here in this blue band, and she is literally peeing away her bones. But he suddenly, when he gets her to stop and go plant-based, within one week, your urinary calcium is normal. Now this is the work of a man who was in my right side an hour and a half ago. This is Colin Campbell. Colin Campbell making small microscopic cancers in the liver of rodents. If he keeps their protein in five, the cancers don't grow. As soon as he starts to increase the cancer, it really kicks off. And what was this thing that we, what protein he was increasing? Was, yes, casein. Here he is, adding casein, the tumor explodes, takes it away, it shrinks, reintroduces it, it explodes, takes it away. Colin Campbell was turning cancer on and off. Now, Popeye had the right idea. Here, hamburger, 37% protein. Here is spinach, 57%. You are not gonna be protein deficient eating plant-based. Now, that is Joe Rolino. And Joe Rolino in the 1920s was a wonderful strong man for Coney Island, where he did feats of strength. And he and his mother, living in Brooklyn, were totally plant-based. Here he is doing a uh, spinning of the spike. And uh, uh, here he is, 103 years old. Okay. I always like to wrap it up with this is the building where I work for the Cleveland Clinic as a surgeon for many years. I like to show this because those of you who have been to Cleveland, I want you to know what the trees look like in February. <laughs> uh, however, now that I've retired from uh, surgery and I work at the Wellness Institute, uh, the budget is somewhat more modest, but the morale is high. <laughs> And uh, finally, one thing I've learned in 57 years since leaving medical school is that while brains are important, nothing, nothing, nothing. Nothing is as important, perhaps, as persistence, 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 best exemplified by this long, young damsel in Life magazine, 1939, trying to learn how to do this. But she stuck with it and stuck with it and stuck with it. And sure enough, finally, lo and behold, before this cruise started, it's my understanding that Sandy Pogo was down in Miami, and he spotted her, and she had got it right. <laughs> so, <laughs> this wraps it up for me, and I want to just say in conclusion that uh, the reason that I guess I'm I haven't retired, that I'm still involved with medicine. I'm more passionate than ever because at the cusp uh, of, of this, we really see what could be a seismic revolution in health. And the seismic revolution in health is never gonna come about from the invention of another pill, another procedure, or another operation. The seismic revolution in health will come about when we have the will and the grit and determination to share with the public 
What is the lifestyle? And most specifically, what is the nutritional literacy that will empower them 